evening and welcome to the regular meeting of the Woodridge Board of Selectmen. It's January 13th, 2015. I'd like to wish everyone a very happy new year. And as we start the new, thank you very much. As we start the new year, we're very fortunate this evening to have at least two of the three members of our state delegation here to talk to us about some of the issues that are important to our town of Woodbridge and what we see coming up. Uh, Senator Crisco had to leave, but Senator Slasberg is here and Representative Clarities, who's also the minority leader of the House. Would you join us up at the table? Um, Oh. Okay. We are very high tech in Woodridge. So I hear that. it over here. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Thank you, Jerry. Um, I want to thank you both very much for being here this evening and taking the time. I know how busy your schedules are, particularly as the session nears. Um, we did have some time to talk just before this evening's meeting about some of the issues that are so important to Woodbridge, and that includes our, our steep grant for the animal shelter that will be coming up and our education issues always on the forefront, including, um, of course, our grant application for the Beecher Road School. Senator Slasberg is the Senate Chair of the Education Committee, which is very important for us. And of course, Representative Clarities is um, essential on all of our issues. So we would appreciate hearing from you any of the things you think um, that are important, particularly for Woodbridge, or what you see coming up in the session that we should be aware of. Thank you for having us. I know. Oh, push. Am I on? Oh, that's okay. Yeah. We're used to pushing buttons. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, as, as Ellen mentioned, Joe had to leave early, but we had met before. I went over. We typically call this our wish list meeting. So you guys tell us what what you need from us, and we tell you kind of update you as to where we are. So one of the things we discussed was the animal shelter, and I know it's been something that I've been involved in throughout time, and you do share with. Bethany and Derby, so I mean, I, I think it's a it's a solid amount of money, but it's also three towns, so I think it's important to um, to upgrade it. I mean, I know it's not really in good in a good position right now. So, steep grant process is now starting for this year going forward. So um, we understand that's one of your priorities in regards to that. I know that Gail would like to talk about some of the education issues because she's the chair of the education committee, but. You know, whether it's school construction grants, steep grants for whatever uh, the subject matter is, that those are certainly things that we all work together to try and get as much as we can. I mean, you all know we have a very serious fiscal situation in the state, but that doesn't mean we don't do whatever we can to, to get money for our towns if we believe that it's reasonable to get it. Thank you. Okay. And thank you also, you know, thank you for inviting all of us to come tonight and um, I will tell you, you know, while we were here tonight, Ellen has uh, always made sure that she's communicated with us about the things that are important to the people in Woodbridge. Um, the lines are always open uh, for her to speak to all of us. And we were talking about how, um, you know, you've got a fairly senior delegation at this point, so it really bodes well for, um, for your town. And it's nice to have somebody who understands the process so well as Ellen does. Uh, to be able to come and share with us her concerns and the things that are important to you. So um, obviously the steep grant, we're all uh, very interested in making sure that that happens and that we are supportive of that for you and um, for the other towns that participate with that. Uh, as the chair of edu as the Senate chair of education, one of the things that I oversee is school construction. Um, so I was very involved in making sure that you were able to get your school construction grant for Beecher Road School. And my understanding is that you've already received dollars for that, so that's uh, moving along smoothly. We focused very strongly, although you don't have any applications in for this <coughs> process, we've changed the process and really streamlined it. Um, the Department of Administrative Services and Construction Services work together to lean the process for school construction. So at some point in the future, should you ever 
be doing it again. It should be a simpler and even faster process, um, but it, that is more meaningful in terms of the questions and the things that we're looking for um, for you. So we're happy to see that moving along. Um, we know that you have a priority with regard to the virtual net metering project. And that's something that the delegation will work together to try to uncover how do we make this move uh, and working with, um, with our partners at the utility companies and our partners up in the, in the legislature to see if there are changes we need to make or if we just need to um, express our advocacy for this. I understand it's a really great project to be able to um, put you know solar panels on a cap landfill as a you know as a way to do this and it's a great way to uh, reduce your carbon footprint here be environmentally friendly but what I really like is that you will be saving a lot of money and I think that's great for you and great for your residents to be able to do that so that's something clearly that we will continue to advocate for um, and you know again back to the education issues because that's my area of um, of, uh, of cognizance most is also working for you on your um, special education and a lot of the other education issues that really matter so much to your constituents. I know Woodbridge is a very education-minded town. You have a lot of people who understand the value of a high-quality education, and so that's what we're working for for people here in Woodbridge and in the rest of the state, every student in the state of Connecticut. So we thank you for having, you here, having us here, and uh, we're just delighted to be working with you. Thank you very much. I did want to mention that uh, just coincidentally, Dr. Stella had called me today to say that he'd been on a conference call of school superintendents that Senator Slosberg organized to talk about special education funding and looking at new ways. It is, you know, it can be very burdensome on budgets and on the schools, and it's a certainly an issue that we're all concerned about. So thank you for that. Do you have a moment? If there are any questions, you have a few minutes. Sure. Uh, anybody, anything that would like to ask about? No. You know, I also what? wanted to say, I mean, clearly we, we typically would communicate with the first selectman, but any of you are welcome, please, to call us at any time with any questions or issues that you have because, I mean, you have your leader, but there's, you know, you're, you all sit on here and have a vote in, in everything that goes on and, you know, sometimes we agree and sometimes we don't agree. So we're here to, as a resource to you in whatever way you need. Great. Well, thank you very much. Good luck with the session. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Good to see you both. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, the second item on our agenda is to announce that once again the town has received the uh, GFOA Distinguished Budget Presentation Award. And uh, not only has the town received that, but Tony gets a special recognition from GFOA for um, making this budget the great document that it is. So I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank Tony so much. To, you know, we have, I believe, the best finance director. Uh, in the state, I, I will add to that that I was um, I was at an event today and ran into somebody who'd been at um, OPM, which is the state budget office, and I asked her what she was doing this, these days. She said, "Well, now she's a consultant to municipalities on budget matters." So to be friendly, I said, "Oh, why don't you come by and say hello?" But she said, "I don't have to come to Woodbridge. You have the best finance director." <laughs> Thank you, Tony, and congratulations. Um, I also, you know, just to, to say what this budget uh, recognition is, it, it's, um, it recognizes the budget as a policy document, a financial plan, an operations guide, and a communications device, and that's taken from the language of GFOA. So it really speaks to um, how we organize the budget, how we communicate with residents, and it's a real tribute to Tony and his department. So thank you again. Uh, number three on our agenda is public comments. Is anyone here for public comment? Yes, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you all very much. I'm Elizabeth Antonucci, and I reside at Seven Hazel Terrace, and I have prepared a written statement that I would like to read that I hope will not be very long uh, about the concerns that we have which is going on on our street. 
Okay, we, the residents at 7, 14, and 35 Hazel Terrace, are having serious problems created and caused by the businesses located at 17 and 30 Hazel Terrace, which consists of, of on-street parking because of grossly inadequate parking for the buildings that house these businesses. Cars are parking in front of our entire front property lines blocking access to our mailboxes, preventing us from entering and exiting our driveways because our view is totally obstructed or cars are parked in front of our driveways and garages. Cars are parked in front of our walkways for our front doors, preventing the ability to use the walkway to get family members in wheelchairs to vehicles for transport to medical appointments. Patrons of these businesses are trespassing on our property to gain access to get in and out of their cars, destroying our landscape and causing liability issues and risks for our residential property. In addition, the street is too narrow to negotiate a U-turn, so cars are blocking the flow of traffic have caused a complete and total traffic jam on Hazel Terrace, which blocked all access to our street, given Hazel Terrace has only one access from June Street and is a dead end street. Cars are driving down the street backwards because they cannot turn around. Given the parking and traffic on the street, only one car is able to get down or up the street given these conditions. Last night, the snowplow was only able to treat the middle of the road because of on-street parking. These conditions created by on-street parking and traffic congestion would block, delay, or stop access for emergency vehicles and limit our snow plowing from being able to be fully removed uh, snow from the street in, in a usual manner. To make this matter worse, the businesses on Hazel Terrace are unstable, with tenants moving in and out so that the residents don't know who is renting or what type of business is being conducted. There is a problem because each new business creates a new and different problem for the residents. Also of concern is these buildings are not rented to capacity. So the potential for more demand for parking and use of the street is a real concern as more and more of the available spaces are rented out to more businesses. In addition, the business on Hazel Terrace operate up to seven days of the week and all hours of the day and night. 17 Hazel Terrace operates six days out of the week and 30 Hazel Terrace seven days a week. Hazel Terrace is a narrow street and is a dead end street with no turnaround ability at the dead end of the street. The only way the street works is when a car can park in a parking lot and either back out or pull out of a parking lot and then is able to make a turn into the street without obstructing the flow of traffic and providing there are no parked cars on the street that will obstruct cars' ability to negotiate a turn. I feel the town needs to take a closer look or may, or may be more informed of the use of these buildings, for indeed there is a need to conduct better assessment of the impact of these businesses on our street and community. Part of the problem is the owners of these business buildings are ignoring the town's requirements for change of use of and are encouraged to do so for there are no consequences for violating the town's requirements that would impose an immediate and an automatic consequence for such violations. I propose that the town develop and implement a violation system whereby the owners of these buildings who violate the town's regulations be fined, pay substantial fines to the town of Woodbridge 
and that the business that is operating without a permit from the town of Woodbridge be denied a permit without exclusion or exception and without any waivers. This may sound harsh when in fact it is not because the owners of these buildings are fully aware of the town's requirements and knowingly violate the regulations, as well as having the, the benefit of using local commercial real estate companies to rent and lease their property who know better. I think it is sad when owners of business buildings and tenants of these buildings misrepresent themselves to zone and planning by making commitments to zone and planning and the residents that they have no intentions of keeping and don't keep and in fact are in violation of the conditions of their permit, which is true for this situation. There needs to be accountability and responsibility placed on these individuals, which is not asking more than we ask of each other in our society. Again, I feel the town needs to develop and implement a system of fines and penalties for violations of permit, for permits, which would be mandated by the town that would bring some relief to zone and planning and that could fairly be applied to all and be in the form of a written document, document so that all those involved in these business ventures are informed and have no defense when a violation occurs. This would also help to stop all the aggravation to the residents as well as the risks and hazards to public safety and access to vital emergency services and services provided by the town. The residents are working with the town to erect no parking signs for all the three residents for we all have the same problems from on-street parking and all need no parking signs without exception. I understand that the town has an ordinance of no parking in front of residential property and requests the same for the residents, all of us on Hazel Terrace who still maintain residential property. It is unfortunate that a few owners and businesses are creating so many problems for all of us residents and for all other businesses that are compliant and have sufficient parking. We may have reached a point that these buildings need to be reassessed for appropriate use that will not infringe the rights of the residential property owners, endanger the residents, and cause a hostile environment in our community. Also, the practice of overlapping parking may work for some cases, but in this case has been a total failure. The town offered this option and was agreed to by the business, but never, not once, utilized by the business. The business was given every chance to stop this on-street parking and did nothing to comply, and this is why I feel strongly that the town needs to establish and enact a system of penalties. Basically, to help prevent this behavior in the future, and because of the potential for these problems to continue, given the turnover of tenants and large buildings with inadequate parking, and renting to businesses whose needs far exceed the capacity of parking for these buildings. For all these reasons and more, we the residents, all of us, all three residents, are requesting and require no parking signs so we too can live in peace and be free from this aggravation and harm caused by the businesses. And I thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I believe the Traffic Commission is looking into this. I, um, mm -hmm. Acting Chief Stewart is here today, and I know they're looking into it, and, and we'll refer your concerns to the building inspector as well. Thank you for coming this evening. Thank you very much for listening. I appreciate all your time. Of course. Um, anyone else here for public yeah. comment? Yes.
Good evening. Thanks for uh, thanks for uh, giving me uh, some time to talk. Uh, I'm here. My name is Jan Gurvich, and I'm a current resident of Woodbridge. I'm here to speak on behalf of my parents, Larissa Ponskaya Vladimir Zector. Excuse me. Just just for the record, which is your name and also your address, please. Sure. Jan Gurvich, 54 Forest Glen Drive, Woodbridge, Connecticut. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. They reside at Hazel Terrace, so I'm going to be actually a build on what Elizabeth just talked about. My comments are more directed towards 17 Hazel Terrace, specifically the business, the dance studio. Uh, but I completely agree with her other comments as well. So um, my parents have resided uh, at 14 Hazel Terrace for over 25 years. And, and also, um, um, I'm sorry, uh, they resided for over 25 years. And uh, I'm speaking on behalf of all the residents of Hazel Terrace, uh, not just my parents, because we have all the same concerns. Um, I'm sure some, if not all of you, are aware of the traffic issues that have been affecting the residents of Hazel Terrace over the past year and a half, and as a result, uh, as a result of a dense studio opening. While realizing that the area is designated as mixed use, this has placed an undue burden on the residents affecting their quality of life and causing numerous inconvenience and safety issues. To put it bluntly, this location, i.e. 17 Hazel Terrace, is not able to handle the traffic associated with the dense studio. It's evident by number of cars going to the location at any given hour. There are eight parking spaces, including one handicap. However, based on simple observation, within an hour you could have over 100 cars picking up and dropping off children. Elizabeth is actually the one that, that did the study and did the research, and uh, uh, she's the one that generated this number. And we can concur, There's, the traffic could exceed 100 cars per hour uh, related specifically to this dense studio. In addition, portion, um, in addition, portion of those arriving stay for the class and consequently need to park, but there are not enough spaces. As a result, cars have no choice but double, triple park, block the driveway of my parents, block the garage entrance of my parents, cause traffic congestion for, for through traffic, as well as residents who are simply trying to get home or leave. In addition, students' parents are forced to drop them off by stopping on the road, creating a safety concern, as oncoming traffic could cause an accident, including injuries to children. It seems to, uh, it seems to me, besides potentially tragic consequences, town could face a serious liability if something like this would occur. Also, in case of emergency, vehicles would have problems passing. The, uh, you know, these are just some of the issues uh, that my parents have experienced, and I'm bringing that up to the, to the attention of this committee. committee. Uh, when town had a meeting about granting approval for the studio to operate about a year or so ago, these, these issues were clearly communicated by the residents. There was also a fact that studio originally began operating without proper town approvals and also caused excessive noise and littering. Despite all the concerns, town chose to approve the studio. Studio owner has given an estimate about the volume of students and cars which appear to be grossly underestimated, based on the figures referenced before. In addition, there were promises made by the studio management and landlord in regards to the class start and time and parking in different locations to limit the amount of traffic. These promises were either not followed or did not work. From the perspective of my parents and other residents on Hazel Terrace, town needs to reconsider the current stand. We are asking for the following action in short term. It appears town has decided to place no parking sign near Seven Hazel Terrace. However, for some reason, that does not apply to my parents' property nor the other neighbor. Logic of the decision completely escapes me, as it essentially means it's not okay to park at Seven Hazel Terrace, but it's fine to do so with other properties. We demand that the same part, no parking sign be placed at the other properties, extending the same level of protection for all residents of Hazel Terrace. As a longer term request, we urge town to evaluate the viability of the location more thoroughly, taking into consideration points that have been brought up in my presentation as well as concerns of other residents. Simply put, if location is not able to accommodate the amount of traffic, it should not operate at this location, as un unintended consequences will certainly follow. If specific evidence is needed to prove the reference statistics and points, including videos and pictures, we will be led together and provide. If, if town chooses not to resolve the issue by, at, at the minimum, granting no parking signs to all residents, my parents will have no choice but pursue the matter through legal recourse, as they strongly believe that these important factors, including serious safety concerns, are being overlooked by the town's administration. 
Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else for public comment? Dick? <coughs> Uh, yeah, I'm Deke Hotchkiss. I'm the chair of the uh, Country Club of Woodbridge Commission. Uh, it's not often that an asset of the town gets press in a national publication, but there was an article about the Country Club of Woodbridge on December 10th in Golf Digest. It was written by David Owen, a golfer, who also writes for The New Yorker, and it has been described by a peer as one of the 50th funniest American writers, a list that includes Mark Twain. We have just completed our fourth season with the golf course. Businesses that are vulnerable to weather lessen the financial risk by developing a foundation of season passes, members, and or outings. Obviously, we were initially a startup and had no members or outings. Also, the golf course was left in pretty sad condition by the prior operator, which made selling outings and, and memberships difficult. We are now approaching a million dollars in annual golf revenues. Membership revenues in 2015 were almost 30% of total golf revenues. Outing revenues have grown from 24,000 in 2012 to 231,000 in 2015. The $1 million revenue level is $250,000 above the level in 2012. Expenses at a golf course are fairly fixed regardless of income, so most of this added revenue falls to the bottom line. Also, in 2016, we will make the last $118,000 payment on a loan used to acquire maintenance equipment. Some of the equipment will need to be replaced, but some of the equipment has 10 to 20 year useful lives. A new smaller loan may be required, but the combination of higher revenues and lesser expense puts us over $300,000 better than in 2012. This has been achieved despite fighting daily the view that we are going to be closed or converted to residential development. By example, outings are frequently booked a year in advance or for multiple years, and often we don't even get consideration by outing directors because of the perceived risk that the facility will be closed. Similar problems occur in sell selling memberships. The pool has been decimated by the talk about a change in use. There were 60 members in 2011, and it grew to 122 families in 2013. But since all the talk about a change, the membership fell back to 61 in 2015. We lost about $100,000 of annual revenues because of this, which includes families that had both pool and golf memberships. The families didn't stop going to a pool, they just went elsewhere. Beecher enrollment is currently almost 100 students higher than five years ago. Kindergarten enrollment in the last three years is at the three highest levels in the last 11 years. House sales in town in 2015 were 45% higher than 2014 and were at their highest level since 2003. These are all demographic indications that the pool will be an increased demand in the future and could be a tremendous success. Billy Casper Golf marketed the property in 2012 and 2013, and the membership doubled. They have offered to market the pool for free, which would also enable them to cross-sell more golf rounds and memberships, but families are going to be reluctant to commit to the pool if we keep talk about, talking about changing the use. I know that you are considering various options for the property. 
I believe that the vast majority of the residents do not want to see a change in the use, but are concerned about the cost of the present use. The historic operating costs of the property have been identified. This includes years in which the property was operated by a third party, years in which it was in startup mode, and years in which the operations were severely impacted by the perception that the use was going to be changed. Obviously, your task is to look forward, but you would have to eliminate a lot of static in the historic operating costs to arrive at a, reason, a reasoned assessment. Here's a simple question. Could the golf course and pool generate enough funds to achieve your financial objectives? It would be a shame to close the pool and the golf course and lose the social, recreational, and environmental values of these assets without answering that question. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Is there anyone else for public comment? <clears throat> Bob Hill, 68 Acorn Hill Road. Happy New Year to everybody. Just a few quick uh, comments. Tony, congratulations on uh, the award. Oh, yeah. so now, how many peat is this now? What's that? How many peat is this? How many times in a row? Yeah, it's, it's uh, a... Needs a new room. Six, six nice. years. <laughs> we appreciate all your thoughtfulness and all your uh, effort in making sure all the reports that we receive are presented and also uh, complete. Um, <clears> the <throat> other comment, which uh, I may... I, said earlier today. Um, I was really pleased yesterday. I was out uh, in the yard late in the afternoon and uh, saw the plow trucks come by putting sand down prior to the, starting the freezing rain coming. And uh, I know when my wife was driving home last night, she got to Woodbridge. At first she got nervous because she saw the sand and she goes, oh, oh, I get it. They're doing it before it gets bad out there. So town does a great job of, and Warren and his crew, uh, terrific job. I'm still debating him about the tree near my house, but that's okay. Uh, <clears throat> um, and, and the last thing, actually two other, one, two other things, um, hopefully I'm not steer, stealing Dr. Stella's um, comments here, and I think it's fairly public at this point um, in the announcement about uh, Dr. Stella as uh, our superintendent for the last 10 years, I think. Uh, uh, when he came uh, to Woodbridge as our superintendent, my wife happened to be the PTO president with the previous superintendent and through the transition. And things could not have been more different uh, in that transition. And he was really a welcome face in a, uh, to our community, not only as a superintendent, but also as a role model for the uh, students, the teachers, and the parents and anyone who's in this community in any way. Uh, prior to his involvement as a, becoming the superintendent, we never saw the superintendent at any public events in town. And I think if I had to kind of measure who makes more, more of the events, is it Ellen or Dr. Stella, I think that it's a close race there. Uh, he, I, <laughs> we see a lot of each other. You see a lot of each other. I don't want to start spreading rumors here, okay? Uh, but I will tell you, um, he will be very tough shoes for us, for us to fill and a very special uh, man in, in, in our community. Uh, I was going to make any comments, really. I know that you have the, uh, the, the pool on the agenda tonight. I know there's discussions, real thoughtful discussions that are going on uh, right now. And, and I think uh, a number of Deke's comments are, are, I think, well taken in terms of giving a little history of where we are at in terms of, hmm, you know, we are kind of moving in a, in a positive way. And um, I think some thoughtful discussion tonight I think is going to be very, very helpful. And I, I think we're kind of at a, a more positive place uh, in terms of some of the static that was going on a few years ago in the discussion. And I think, I think this board is kind of at a point now where I think you're all collectively working towards let's all work together on a... A, a productive solution. So thank you so much again and Happy New Year. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. Congratulations.
Uh, the next item on the agenda is our Woodbridge Board of Education report from Dr. Stella. We're saying good evening, Dr. Stella, but we're all crying. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> we laugh and cry together. That's, uh, <laughs> um, well, let me start before anything else by wishing everyone a happy new year. We're off and to a to good you. start. It's well, uh, nice to welcome the children back and the teachers back. And I, I do remember starting 10 years ago, my first official day was a blizzard. And um, I wasn't sure which superintendents to call or stations and so on, but we managed and we closed the schools. And that got me off to a great start with the children and with the teachers. Uh, so looking back, the past 10 years have been absolutely wonderful. Beecher Road School is, um, is a jewel of a school. It's a microcosm of what education should be throughout the country. And it, that hasn't happened by accident. It hasn't happened because of one person. Uh, this is a community that's so wonderful to work in. Um, it's a town that promotes volunteerism. It's a town that promotes um, discourse, civil discourse, <coughs> involvement, decision making. It's a real community. There are different worldviews at times and so on, but things are always worked out. And um, it, the town really values education. Uh, so, so it's a model. And I wanted to come and personally thank the members of the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Finance for the thumbprint that they've had on any type of success at the school. Um, very often your job is a, a, not a, you don't get the thanks that you deserve you work so hard and give so much of your talents and so on, and you care so much as volunteers. Your support, support has made a tremendous difference in helping uh, uh, the Woodbridge School District and Beecher Road School. I believe the school is, and the district is very well postured um, to move into another chapter as we move along in life. Transitions have to be embraced, and I would, I love, uh, I love our school, our town so much, I wouldn't, wouldn't even think of, uh, of retiring if I thought the, uh, the, the system was not in good shape and, and ready to move ahead. Our teachers are outstanding. Our administrative team is, uh, is, uh, works very well together. Um, and, and again, the, the support of the town is there. So thank, thank you very, very much. And as I told the faculty yesterday, they're so supportive. But I said, remember, I'm not retiring tomorrow. There's six months to go when we have a lot of work to do during that time. And uh, I'll be meeting with the, uh, with the Board of uh, Education on Tuesday. Lisa Connors is a representative here tonight. And we have an excellent board. It's a, every individual on the board um, has, um, is, has a, a history of success in every, everything they've done. They're, they're very, very smart. They're very <coughs> focused on children, on education. And they're gonna make sure, I know it, uh, that the right candidate is picked um, uh, to, to take over. And uh, so we'll, we'll look forward to that. And I will do. Uh, I will cherish every single day that I have left um, in my tenure here, and I will always be on call for any any way that I could support you. But before I forget, I want to congratulate Tony and the town on the award. Tony, I don't know if you noticed, but over the past years, I take notes when you give your present uh, budget presentation and, uh, and your budget over there, and, uh, and you always give me good coaching tips in preparing for our, for our budget. A few items that may be of interest to you is that. We're well postured for the future. Thank you for all the support that you've given and our different boards for our technology movement. Remember, technology is a tool uh, of education and it's one that gives choices to children as far as how they approach their education, but also gives them an opportunity for innovation and, uh, and creativity and acceleration in learning. We are gonna have a uh, superintendent's parents curriculum academy, that's what we call it, on January 28th. And we're inviting members of our parent community, our board members, and any community member to come and just have a dialogue uh, based on where we are now. And the whole town has supported our technology initiative. Where do you see us going? What are your thoughts on where we're going? And we'll use that as a, as a basis of forming a committee and task force afterwards and coming up with a, with a new updated plan so that when we request capital monies and so on, that that the town will know that there's a careful blueprint as far as where we're going and that, the, uh, and that we expect to see results with it. The extended day program is, uh, is, is doing very, very well. That's such a unique program in our school system, as you know. But I had a chance to visit the Chinese classroom 
and it, it, there were two classrooms mm -hmm. teaching Chinese, and a small of us to hear first and second grade is singing songs in, in Chinese. I'm not exactly sure what they're saying, but it's joyful songs. You're saying, don't retire, Dr. Smith. <laughs> That's how, oh, and the, uh, And we're, we're starting to, uh, our newest members to the tech team, Ms. Yulako, is uh, working on a special program. They extended, they purchased a, three -day, a 3D uh, copier. And so that's part of our engineering uh, initiative that we that we have at the school. The the, uh, the drama club has over well, approximately seventy members there, grades one one to six, and expect a nice rendition of Alice in Wonderland that's coming up in the in the springtime. Um, just want to see if there's anything else that I could share with you. Uh, we finished the negotiations. Uh, we had three negotiations this year. Uh, were completed. The last one was the CILU, and that will be reflected in our budget request too. Uh, we look forward to presenting our budget request for your consideration. So, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Any questions for Dr. Stella? Okay. Thank you very, very Thank much. You so Thank much. you so much. We're now at item five on the agenda, and we welcome Frank DeLeo and Stephanie Charleglio for an update on. West River Pond Lily Dam and the uh, West River Greenway. Thank you so much for coming. We know there's a lot happening. There is a lot happening. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Stella, you're wonderful. <laughs> I just want to throw that in there. <laughs> Happy New Year and congratulations, Tony. Congratulations. You know, before you begin, um, one of the things I've learned in this job is how much longer projects take than one might originally think. And I learned from Stephanie and Frank what it means to really stick with a project. When I first became aware of the Pond Lily Dam removal project, um, I'm not sure about you, Steph, but I understood that Frank had been working on this for 35 years. <laughs> so congratulations. Well, There's actually, real progress actually, now. this particular segment is nine years. Just, you oh, know, so since it's overnight. But this particular segment. <laughs> this part of it. This part this of it. Part it started of it. in 1982. Yeah, it started in 1982, oh, though. Yeah. Well, you're, yeah. you're correct. We welcome your update. Well, I was going to go first, if, if, oh, if you don't ahead. mind. Um, the West River watershed runs through the towns of Bethany, Woodbridge, Hamden, New Haven, and West Haven. I'm a member of the West River Committee in Woodbridge and also the West River Coalition and the West River, the Coalition Steering Committee, as is Frank. Um, I'd like to present you our town's copies of the West River Watershed Management Plan, which shows um, the watershed management goals and objectives for water quality, habitat protection and restoration, land use, open space, and public access of the watershed. Um, and I'd like to thank Ellen and Tony and the Board of Selectmen for the opportunity to be a participant in this coalition. And I look forward to our town signing on to the West River Greenway Plan and the Watershed Plan at our Council of Governments meeting, um, hopefully in the next month. Mm -hmm. We're going to plan for that. Um, and um, we're working with Carl Lamento to set up a date for COG, I think. <coughs> Excuse me. I also want to thank Frank DeLeo for all of his hard work on these committees and for the removal of the Pond Lily Dam. <laughs> what a great accomplishment, finally. That, that was the whole committee, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> but I'm just going to pass these out. I have some maps of the watershed, and then I have a map of the Pond Lily Dam, where they're going to remove them. Frank will tell you about that. Thank and you. Thank Frank, you, Steph. Well, Frank, are you going to explain why removal of the dam is so important? Excuse me? Will, will you be explaining why removal of the dam is so important? Oh, what it means? No, first of all, one. yes. Just the whole what, town. Thank you, Steph. No, I haven't. What was occurring um, in the last few years before we decided to remove the dam was we were getting more and more floods with less and less water. In other words, it took less water to do the same damage that was done uh, with not, not so much with the 82 floods, but with similar floods. So we had five to seven inches of rain, which wasn't a lot of rain. The 1982 flood was uh, 20, 10 to 20 inches of rain. So that caused a lot of damage, it's understandable. But we were getting uh, water flooding Litchfield Turnpike with five to seven inches of rain. So we decided that something had to be done. And th these were uh, occurring more frequently. We were sandbagging every year try to keep the water from coming into the, into the buildings and things like that. So after so many consecutive years, we decided to uh, form a committee and, and work on it. And uh, I want to thank 
the uh, mem uh, members of the Board of Selectmen, because almost all the members were very, very receptive to the committee. Thank you, Alan. Tony was, was, was always uh, receptive. Beth, of course, and... Uh, I got I have a slight history I, I'd like to uh, present right now. On November 15, uh, 5th, 2015, a dam breaching celebration occurred at the Pondley Dam. Our committee wants to thank Beth Keller for presenting for the town of Woodbridge at this event. Beth was there. Uh, Ellen was away, unfortunately, that, uh, that, that week, but uh, Ellen had supported this project uh, all the way through. And she also went to our celebration when we got the uh, funds from uh, Rosa Delora and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Thank you, Alan, for, for coming to that one. Um, <clears throat> we owe, owe many thanks to the residents along the West River that supported this process. Also, thanks to the uh, entire Board of Selectmen, uh, especially our former uh, first selectman, uh, Ed Sheehy. If Ed Sheehy had not agreed to have the town sponsor this project, we would not be speaking about it right now. Ed was a fine man, and we uh, really appreciate his help with, with this project. The project began almost nine years ago following the flooding occurred in the southeast section of Woodbridge, April 14, 2007. Repet repetitive flooding in this area was becoming more frequent and more severe. A group of residents decided something had to be done. We formed an association that, association that later became the West River Restoration and Flood Mitigation Committee. We contacted did our elected town officials and Rosa Delara. Rosa promised to help. She said it would take time. She was right on both of those accounts. <laughs> Rosa supported us with our Hurricane Sunday, uh, Sandy funding through the Department of the Interior's U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service grant. This grant provided the bulk of the funding for the dam removal. Uh, thank you, Rosa. Many stakeholders were involved in this pro uh, process that led to the dam removal. Uh, Without their support, this project would have never been possible. I have uh, some of the folks I'd like to mention that were involved in that process. First of all, our Woodbridge Rest, uh, West River Restoration and Flood Mitigation Committee. And I'm going to mention every one of the members. Mike Walters, Chris Dickerson, Buddy DiGennaro, Stephanie Chiloglio, Dorothy Martino, Tashi Corrado, Thomas Kentlick, and our new member, uh, Fred, would you please stand up and be recognized? Fred Anderson just joined our committee uh, this past year. And he's been a great help so far. So I'd like to thank all those uh, members of the committee that did so much to help help this get done. Um, other people, Ed, Ed She, again, our first selectman who played support for the town um, nine years ago. Tony Genovese, finance, direct, finance director of Woodbridge, who helped with a grant for our first flood study. Tony was also a member of our steering committee. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Laura Wildman from American Rivers, who guided us through the process of gathering stakeholders and suggested government and nonprofits that could help. Steve Gephardt of Connecticut DEP Fisheries, who stressed the importance of habitat restoration as well as flood mitigation. This is a not only a flood mitigation uh, project, it's also a great project for the ecology, and Steve was involved in that part of it. The river herring are, are going to be able to come back up river and spawn in Canoles Pond, and that's going to make a, a, a better habitat for uh, the fishery in, in that river. So uh, that, that's where Steve Gephardt helped us with that. Tom Cleveland, who was our grant writer and project manager, Tom obtained grants for planning and design of the dam removal. Tom also worked with Connecticut Fund for the Environment and helped transfer the leadership role to Connecticut Fund for the Environment in the spring of 2012. I remember Tony was a little bit relieved yeah. on that one because they were a great help. I mean, Tony was carrying the load yeah. for quite a while there. Yeah. Uh, members of the New Haven Land Trust, Chris Randall, executive director at our first meeting, J.R. Logan, president then, still president. Um, Lucian Bonifer, Diff Rare Conservation Officer, and Justin Ellick, President uh, Executive Director. The staff at Connecticut Fund for the Environment, Gwen McDonald, who wrote for and received Hurricane Sandy funds. John Champion, who constantly de dealt with fund shortages and fundraising. 
Ken, uh, Kendall Barberi, who led the effort to develop the West River Watershed Management Plan. That's the one that uh, Stephanie one just, just passed out to you. And, and that's going to be a great help because what it does, it's going to help us to get funds from uh, DEP and uh, EPA. So we can, we can write for grants because, of, because we have this watershed management plan. Um, uh, the entire uh, staff at, oh, of course, uh, we can't forget Curtis Johnson, program director, and the entire staff at uh, Connecticut Fund for the Environment. Connecticut DEP Commissioner Robert Clee and Chris Malik, senior environmental analyst, Connecticut DEP, uh, DEP supported this project with technical advice as well as funding. Robert Clee and Chris also advocated the West River watershed plan. So the DEP was really involved and helpful in, in all these projects we're working on right now. Um, Rosa Delora, of course, who supported this project from day one. Rosa did everything in her power to move the project forward. The bulk of the funding was derived from Sandy funds that Rosa obtained through the Department of the Interior's U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, grant. Susan Patton, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and Lori Benoit, U.S. <coughs> Fish and Wildlife Biologist. Uh, without the continued support and funding from U.S. Fish and Wildlife, the Pond Lily Dam removal would not have been possible. We got the bulk of the funding from that uh, particular organization. Okay, uh, going on. Presently, the dam has been breached and the access road along the eastern side of the Pond Lily Preserve has been built. The riverbed will be reestablished as close to its original uh, location as possible. In addition to this work, riprap and and or concrete will be placed at the base of the Motel Bridge and the Pond Lily Avenue Bridge. Uh, this is to prevent scouring due to the uh, lowered water level. Riffles and pools are, be are, beginning, are <clears throat> beginning at the Motel Bridge are being introduced to reproduce a natural river system. Plantings and other anemones will be added to the reconstruction site. This site will be a focal point for trails leading north from the north and south from the preserve. We, be, we will be working with New Haven Land Trust, Solar Youth, and Connecticut Fund for the Environment, and others to develop recreational and educational opportunities on this site. Uh, the dam removal will help mitigate flooding. It will also help the ecology of the river. Uh, reiterating Curtis, Kurt Johnson from Connecticut Fund for the Environment, we believe uh, that Kurt said it best. The healing of the river has begun. Not, a, not only has the damage stopped, but the healing has begun. We are allowing nature to heal the river. Our hope for the future is a free-flowing river with fish riding to aquatic insects. The restoration of the West River will give our children and grandchildren the same opportunity to enjoy growing up along the West River that many of us experience. Some members of the West River Restoration and Flood Mitty uh, mitigation Committee are also members of the West River Watershed Coalition. Uh, of course, that means uh, our, new Fred, our new member, Fred, and, and of course, uh, uh, Stephanie and myself. We're, we're members also of the uh, coalition. The coalition consists of organizations from all towns along the West River, the Regional Water Authority, the Great New Haven Pollution Control Authority, Friends of Edgewood Park, the New Haven Land Trust, and our West River uh, Restoration Committee, to name a few. The coalition is one of the strongest advocates for improvement of the West River. The Watershed Coalition, with the cooperation of other groups along the river, Connecticut Fund for the Environment, and Connecticut DEP, has completed a watershed management plan for the West River. Stormwater management of uh, com combined sewer overflows and increasing the capacity of the Greater New Haven water pollution plant is already underway. The uh, coalition is also advocating green infrastructure. Bioswales and rain gardens are being constructed in the, along the Edgewood Park area. Stream assessments are being done to locate illegal connections contributing to bacteria levels. With this watershed management in place, we can apply for uh, 319 Clean Water Act grants from DEEP to help with further improvements to the West River. Uh, that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. it. As far We're as we're working it, on all of it, sounds very, <laughs> very complete. But not all of it. But but uh, <laughs> this uh, 
watershed plan that's, uh, th that uh, Steph brought, brought to you is, uh, is a big deal. I think it's going to really help us to uh, finish the job we started uh, restoring the West River because what it does is it goes after – we're very fortunate in this part of, of the river because we don't have a lot of pollutants, but as you get down river away from Canoles Pond, it changes, and, and there, there's a, a lot of pollutants, and uh, there, there's a lot of uh, things that need to be done. A lot of it has to be has to do with uh, the uh, water pollution control. They can make improvements, and the screen infrastructure would be a great help because if we can keep the polluted water from getting into the system in the first place, that that that's as much as the help is trying to get rid of it after, after it's, it's gotten into the pollution uh, control plant. So they're, they're working on that. They've already done some of these uh, bioswales and rain gardens uh, down along Red Edgewood Park and, and around the boulevard. And that, that's been done with uh, the West River Watershed Coalition. They, they've done a lot of work on that. Uh, so we're... Uh, Doing our best we can to, to uh, improve the river. Uh, there, there's another matter that I wanted to bring up, and that was uh, about the flooding along concerning Merritt and Manila Avenue. Our committee, <clears throat> there was a study done there, and I have it here, uh, Manila Avenue, Merritt Avenue drainage study, and uh, our committee recommend, recommends a review there <clears throat> by the town engineer because uh, the study uh, points to uh, I'll read it. The study recommends sta state improvements and town improvements. It's, it explicitly states some things that can be done. Uh, the state has done some work in the area uh, on an 18-inch drain pipe uh, that, that drains water from above the tunnel and into the West River. They haven't uh, completed the work there. Uh, but we're uh, uh, contacting them to try to get them to finish th their part of the work. Uh, the study also st specifically states uh, town improvements. Under drains are called for in locations where high groundwater occurs. And uh, this study was completed in March 2012. Uh, our, our committee would like to recommend that the Board of Selectmen authorize our, our town engineer to review the study and advise on a path forward if uh, you people would be willing to help us with that. Because, uh, you know, there's uh, still quite a bit of flooding. There's still quite a bit of flooding that, that occurs down rains. there. We haven't had a lot of rain. No, right. When it rains, there's but when we do get underwater. when we do get rain, it, it's a, it, it hasn't improved. The state has done some work on their end. But one of the problems is there's, uh, there's no curbs on, on the uh, Route 15 highway where it enters the tunnel. Uh, and that whole area drains off into the uh, Merritt Avenue area. And also uh, the West Rock Ridge drains down into the mm -hmm. Merritt Avenue area. So uh, it, it's just receiving an awful lot of water. But there are some specific recommendations uh, where cement drains can be put in and tied right into the existing uh, catch basin drainage that's already there. And I don't think it's an awful lot of work. It, it's just a, a matter of, of bringing it to the attention of, of the board and uh, requesting that s something be done about it. So uh, our, our committee would greatly appreciate it if uh, you could have our town engineer look at that and advise on it. Okay, thank you. Um, I can make a copy of the study. We have the study. We have the study. I don't know if you everybody have has the study. study but we'll we can get it to you. Yeah, they have it. Maybe Maria okay. hasn't seen it. This but is the same it. study that's been used for the last few years that was done <coughs> recommending those tie-ins to the mm -hmm. basin. This isn't a new study. This is the one no, that we've seen. No, this is the one from This was done in 2012, but nothing's been... We've been working on other things, so we didn't come to the committee with this particular mm -hmm. study, although, you know, it, it was done, and people are in that area are very concerned about getting something done about this, so. Uh, just, 
That's if you could remind us, I don't believe there was a, a large cost basis to our town on their recommendations. Is that right? It was. I, a, I, I, I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't think it was. No, I don't I believe think it, it was. was. One of the state. Uh, it, it's, it's possible. I'm not going. You know, don't quote me on it. It's possible that's something that uh, the public works may be able to help with. You know, I mean, I understand they have some equipment. Love to get a copy. They do put in study before our time. I think. I think Ed, oh yes, yeah, you were, yeah. yes, um, Tony, you were. We'll make sure everybody the has study was before you were on, Ed on board. ordered the study where you guys, some maybe Susan or somebody was here when they ordered the study. Um, but we've seen it, some of us. But yeah, we certainly. Were I'd love to see it. Um, I work on a state organization that does these yeah. things, and um, I'd love to see it because I mean, I know the problem. I live on. The good side of Litchfield. Oh, do you? Oh, okay. On the, on the <laughs> okay, so there, so right? you're quite aware of what was all the good FEMA, sides. All, all the people uh, asked us to pay for flood insurance, and I had to prove to them that I wasn't part of that Litchfield area. Okay, so, so you, anyway, I, I was very interested. And I would like, I, okay, I very good. Then, uh, yeah, thank you for, for considering this. You know, I, I think. Yeah, and, and, and if, if you need and a, if you need other copies. Oh, okay, Jerry will have. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions or well, anything else? I, I would also su suggest that maybe sometime in, when the weather gets better, the, the town organize a walk to see all the way the river is meandering through from here to New Haven. Well, now that you mention it, uh, the, the <laughs> Frank's been organizing. We, we do have, we do have, we actually do have walks, and Ellen's been on some of those walks. The uh, West uh, River Look, watershed. I did an art project by the Edgewood Park, and we could tie in very well. Mm -hmm. So, right, and I, I believe we're doing a walk. We have three uh, walks scheduled this spring. So. Right. Yeah, and, and we're doing a walk down, down, all Edgewood the way down. Park, we're, yeah. we're doing a walk from, from the Pond Lily Dam down to Edgewood Park, uh, yep. and that would be in the spring, June. Uh, yeah. on, on, in, uh, in June, and then from Edgewood Park to, to the Titan. The cause of the art project that I did on, on Edgewood Park is still there. No, we can send you a list of yeah, you know, definitely. All the walks. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, we'd be glad and to. And I know a park property owner. Um, where we can sort of meet in the middle. I mean, she's right on the banks of one of these things that were done, was done. Um, what is her name? Not coming to me, but she lives right by, you know, behind, um, she has a property right by, uh, what's that area? There's a, there's a wine in Westville, in Westville. Oh, Westville, yeah. okay, all right, yeah. Well, so certainly we'll follow up, and we always yeah. get the when we get the dates. Betsy always distributes them and puts them out again. So we'll make sure everybody knows right. we've got yeah. the reports. And yeah. thank you so much right. for your well, diligence right. and determination. Oh, you, you have, have this, excuse me before we finish. So you have you have a, a blueprint there, right? Uh, so I, here's I, the the, the you, um, big reports. The, the, we'll leave the, on Jerry Shaw's the, desk, the, so anybody who wants to see it can take a look. All right. Anyhow, the right right now what's been done at the band is at at the dam is they have an act road going in and they they have built some riffles um, close to the hotel, to the motel bridge there mm -hmm. and those riffles are directing the water into the proper area yeah. so that the stream bed will, will be reestablished and and that area also you there, get a there, chance go down and look yeah also you're you're gonna, you're, you'll probably right, so you can take a good look over there and you can see everything it's you'll really probably cool. see some uh, equipment around the Ponley bridge because they're also reinforcing um, the area around that bridge, the footings around that bridge, uh, because of the scouring, and the motel bridge. But uh, that's where we are right now. Thank, Thank you, for your you time. so much. Thank, Thank you. you for the update. Thank you. Uh, we're at item number six on the agenda. Lisa Connor, who is the chair of our Energy Task Force, is here with a proposal. Lisa is also on the Beecherwood School Board of Education, so you have your work cut out for you. So I'm in the future tears. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, and I do want to thank um, Lisa and Laura Fernandez and Paul Rossi, who's now joined your group, for all the great work you've been doing and helping Woodbridge really be in the forefront of clean energy and, and um, environmental stewardship. So and thank, thank you, you all for, for your support. Um, last time I was here, we were talking about the light bulb fair, um, and uh, you authorized spending a portion of a Bright Ideas grant that the town uh, received. Uh, to buy the light bulbs to give out to town residents um, that we spent about 2500 of the $10,000 that we have earned so far um, and since then the task force has been exploring ways to spend the rest of that money um, it, 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 the money can be spent on energy conservation projects for the town uh, we've been in conversation with Tony and with um, 
some of our folks from UI, Mike Stein and Gary Padovino. Um, and through these discussions, we're recommending, we've suggested that we put out a request for proposals to upgrade the lighting, uh, the interior lighting at the library and the exterior lighting at the firehouse to LEDs. Um, and to some extent, we need to go through this process to kind of understand what it is the project would entail, what the cost would be. Um, we also had talked about a couple other things, uh, perhaps looking into a broader project involving upgrading the controls uh, for the different building systems, uh, which is sort of a much more significant project. Uh, and we've also talked about updating the town's energy audit for the municipal buildings. Um, I think they're, very, they're all very worthy projects. Um, but we thought that the lighting project made sense both as a discrete uh, project that we could really see some results from uh, in fairly short order. You know, lighting in general uh, has a very short turnaround time in terms of payback. Um, and it's very visible. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, people see the lights at the library, they see the lights at the firehouse, and it's sort of a good symbol of the work that the town is doing overall. And so really, I think I'm just here to let you know that that's where we are thinking, and I think the direction that Tony is planning to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will see what comes back. Um, it, with respect to the projects you're thinking about, have you spoken with the fire department or commission or no. the library commission? Betsy has. I've spoken with the, um, with the chief and with the director of the library, and the chief was already beginning to explore that. Not, I haven't been able to follow up to see where they are in the process, and the library director was very excited. He did bring Wait. it up at the commission meeting, so okay. they are aware of it. I know they talked about it last week, so good. Uh, question, will L uh, these kinds of lights, uh, will they change the look of the firehouse? I mean, sometimes it's like over-lighted. You, you can probably get a sense for that difference when you see some street lights in New Haven that have mm -hmm. been switched over. It does change the look a little bit. Okay, and that um, means also that we are spending less on energy, correct? Exactly. Excellent. Yes. That sounds great. Exactly. Um, I have a question. Yeah, please, Tony, go ahead. I know I just, uh, the indoor lighting is uh, one thing. The outdoor lighting at the firehouse, uh, I'm just wondering what research has been done there. I, I unfortunately remember that there has been an issue before about the lighting outside of the firehouse and what was proper, what was improper, maybe what had to be removed or changed mm -hmm. uh, because of where they are and as far as what residents can see, I believe it was in the corner, there was at one point lighting that had to go from permanent lighting to more of a, uh, in yeah, in the back corners, right. So I'm just wondering if yeah. you should keep that in mind. Maybe Terry Gilbertson mm -hmm. might have it. I remember he had to deal with some of that issue. Mm -hmm. So as far as maybe all the lighting, I don't know. But <coughs> I, I, I believe in the back they had to do some changes there because okay. it, it affected, affected the people. Apparently. Yeah. So that you just might want to have Yeah, maybe. that's a very important point. I think yeah. they had to put on... Uh, Correct. There were shades that were put on some of the lights in the right. back. So they, they had to actually block off some lights. of the lights. So you just right. might want to contact Terry with that sure. part. That's all I have to offer. Sure. Because there's tributary oh, yeah, river down there, and I think the habitat of uh, uh, you know natural animals are being affected by this lighting. But and to some <clears throat> and to some extent, any of these um, proposals may well take a look at what the right what kind of systems you want to have in place to control the timing on things like that, so that That's we're right. not yeah. you know overusing our lighting. I just have a question for Jerry, actually. Do we need to authorize the committee to do an RFP, or they can go ahead and just that, once <coughs> they get the response? I think they can go on and do Okay, it. and certainly yes, there's... And they bring the responses back. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. Anything else for Lisa? No, thank you so much. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great for doing this. Okay. Um, <coughs> Chief Stewart, we have a few items. Happy New Year, everyone. And to you. Thank Again, you. Tony, congratulations. <laughs> I know that Tony's been he's been a great asset to me in, in preparation of my budget. And uh, uh, I just want to thank him. Um, so, Ray, the first item is the Homeland Security MOU. If you could describe uh, what that's um, about, I mean, it, please. And yeah, I mean, it comes under Emergency Management and Homeland Security. Um, it's a yearly MOA that has to be signed. And the only reason it has to be signed is, is each year is because there's um, – additional fundings that come out each year and you have to have an independent MOA to cover those. Uh, and one of the other um, uh, important things that is, that's addressed in the MOA, and it's not really a concern for Woodbridge because we don't have any large items that were bought in past years, but um, departments like New Haven, uh, Milford, 
uh, North Haven, three of those. New Haven, they have the fire trailer uh, that was bought. I mean, it's a $300,000 item uh, that was bought through uh, funding uh, through the state. Uh, New Haven takes ownership of that. And that's one of the appendixes that are in that, in that MOA. So it's just an agreement to say that they, they take the, the uh, fiduciary responsibility of that, that item, uh, as well as Milford has some, some large items and some of the other uh, departments within uh, the 30 towns that are associated with Region 2, which we belong. On each of those 30 towns, we are required to sign that document. Thank you. Um, other questions for Ray on this? Uh, if not, um, is there a motion to authorize the first selectman to, um, a, to uh, adopt this resolution of the Woodbridge Board of Selectmen? And I, I will read it. I think there's one typo in it, which I will correct as I read. Um, yeah. um, Resolve that the Woodbridge Board of Selectmen may enter into with and deliver to the State of Connecticut Division of Emergency Management and Homeland Security Department of Emergency Services and Public Protection, any and all documents which it deems to be necessary or appropriate, and further resolved that Ellen Scalatar, as first selectman of the town of Woodbridge, is authorized and directed to execute and deliver any and all documents on behalf of the town of Woodbridge and the Woodbridge Board of Selectmen, and to do and perform all acts and things which she deems to be necessary or appropriate to carry out the terms of such documents, including but not limited to executing and delivering all agreements and documents contemplated by such documents. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Any Second. questions or discussion? Where not? Where does the resolution come from? State. I, it come, yeah. Yeah, the from the state. state. I'm a lawyer, as you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to make the comments, but I'm just curious. It's, we don't draft it, I can I, assure you. I'm glad. I'm happy um, to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> um, anything else? If not, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, thank you. And uh, item number eight, Ray, is the vehicle replacement. Vehicle replacement. It was on, uh, unfortunately, last month we had a vehicle, one of our vehicles that was involved in a motor vehicle accident. Uh, it, you know, it wasn't our officer's fault, but it, the vehicle has been totaled. And I just want permission to the next purchase of, of the vehicle to replace that uh, would be done to the state bid instead of going out to uh, out to bid for the vehicle. Correct. It's, the, it's common practice that we've done in, in past years. You know, we've had very good luck with, with the, the company that's been on the state bid. Other questions for Ray? I just have a question. Yeah. Is there insurance? There is. So, yeah. so yeah. the total price is this price, the 25? Well, what's the total it is cost? It says 25, 545. Is that with insurance? That's the, bid, that's insurance? the bid price that you, okay. you, you buy it before. Uh, mm -hmm. Right now, I'm still negotiating uh, removal of the equipment. We're going to get credit for that, replacement of the equipment for that. And then uh, the insurance company is going to give us, uh, you know, a, a total estimate of the car. So we can salvage some of the equipment from the car that was. We can we can salvage everything from the car. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually really really pretty good, and I, and I and I think I'm probably going to get a substantial amount for for both those because the, they're they're going to credit us for removing all that equipment out of the car right. as well as placing it back into the car, which is a cost that we normally pay. We're funding the purchase through insurance proceeds, not not entirely. Is it entirely? No, no, no. no. Short, this is, this is it was a 2013 vehicle that had, unfortunately, it only had 23,000 miles. It was our supervisor's vehicle. Uh, so, I mean, where's the rest of the money? So it depends on how Ray w manages the um, with the equipment and with the um, the sur surplus for the funds that we get from insurance. Uh, could either cover in his vehicle budget or they'll have some um, uh, funds that they can use from their uh, programs. So we're not sure yet, but we'll work it out. Yeah. But from the police yeah. department, at this point, I mean, the car it's from the police department. Yeah. 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 Correct, Correct. from the police department. Yeah. 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 We'll work it out. So. <laughs> right, right. But we're purchasing this We can negotiate that. Yeah. We, we need to purchase it now because it's something that's in use yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. every day. Right. So the, the, um, the, purchasing the motion, question. Yeah, the motion is to allow the police department to go out on state bid to purchase Correct. the right. vehicle. So, so, we'll make so that motion. Beth makes the motion. Is there a second? Second. Any other questions or discussion for Ray? Not all those in favor. Thank All right. Anyone opposed? Thank you. Right. Thank you. And um, we have one other question for you, Ray, which is the issue of the fence at the top of West Rock. We've talked about this before, and it's state property, and the state was going to make sure that was taken care of. Do you have an? Update? That was my assumption, and I apologize. It, you know, and and I, I thank you for you know bringing it back to our attention. 
But the good news is that uh, bringing it back to our attention, we checked it. We checked it the other day. Uh, we were working with the DOT right over here at Pond Lily, uh, and then we, we moved from them because they're, they're, they really deal with the roads. Uh, this is, and then we ended up with Bridge Maintenance. I went directly to Milford and Bridge Maintenance, which they're the ones that handle the, the there are two gates, one on each side of the tunnels uh, that are, uh, at some times are closed, but they're not locked. Uh, they reassured us that they will in fact have those locked by the 22nd of this month, because uh, they're responsible for them. Um, and then we'll check and make sure that they are done by that date. Uh, as well as there was, a, there was a small portion of the fence that, that really uh, separates uh, Manila Avenue to the parkway. Um, and, and, and don't get the misconception. I know a lot of the people down there are, are, are complaining that people come through there. Well, there still is access, uh, but it is a deterrent. Uh, and I don't want you to get the misconception that, that the fence keeps people out. Uh, because uh, even though you know we identified where the damage was on the fence, it's going to be repaired. They promised it, us that it would be repaired. Uh, but you go you go about 100 feet up the up the up the mountain. You can go right around the fence. So I, I just want you to know that. Oh, that, at that night, we love you, I mean, you don't you don't have to go through that little hole. You can just go right around it. So, uh, but but that's the purpose of it. It wasn't there to keep people out. It was a, it was a turn to have people not you know not to be going up on the parkway and things like that. So Ray, um, it would be helpful to us if you check again on the 22nd that Absolutely. it's done and just let us know. And I'll make sure that that, that, that was in fact done. But. Um, at least we were able to make contact with the, the people that will do the repairs. Great. Um, any other questions for Ray? Anything else? Um, great. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Uh, okay. The next item is the um, the electric vehicle charging station. We have through a state grant set up an electric vehicle charging station over at the public works facility. And we now have the opportunity to receive another state grant, which fully pays for the charging station. This one would be located at the library in the side parking lot, in the old parking lot. Um, do you want to speak anything to this, Tony? Anything you want to um, say about it? The only thing I, I wanted to, um, just some facts about the uh, charging station. Um, there um, are a few years, I believe it's three, where you cannot charge for the use of the station, but after that you can. Um, a four-hour charge, we checked with the um, supplier, uh, will cost $2.52. So if the, the, the charging station is used continuously for 365 days, assuming six four-hour charges uh, a day, it's $5,518. Income to the town. No, that oh, would, it would cost an electricity. You can't charge oh. people. Oh, okay. that's, that's, I just wanted to give you the yeah, maximum worst exposure, scenario. worst case scenario. Right. I okay. can tell you that I have not seen um, that much use do do down here. Because Tony can see nor, it. You see it from your window, right? But you we, can see no, it nor, have I see, nor have I <laughs> noticed a, um, any, um, any impact in our electric bill. But mm -hmm. I, it does get used. You've seen it, Jerry, yeah. correct? On occasion, but we can't monitor it right yet. Correct. Right. That uh, digitally, we Correct. can't until until you start to charge for it. That's part of the grant. It's part not of the grant. It's right. Not they don't want. It's to it's to encourage right. people to use it to get people used to using it and buying cars, and then right. eventually you can charge. So why do we right. need two within hundred yards of each other? You said why do we need two? Yeah, why do we, we need two? We don't. Right we don't. Ha we don't have to have two, we but we have an opportunity. It's, you know, I, I think it's it's a green energy initiative. It's an opportunity to show that we are participating in this. It's we, not. We do have 29 what registered plug-in vehicles in Woodbridge. What about a different location? In case you were wondering. Yeah, how about southern Woodbridge? Is this grant specific to an area or anywhere in Woodbridge? In other words, is there a potential Maybe. that near the Merritt Parkway where I do know that these go on a We've, map and, and people who have plug-in cars go on a website correct, which tells right. them where they are. Correct. And certainly off the Merritt, you know, more commonly used. Well, I guess we put it on town property. Do we have town property? Correct. Correct. For us to do it has to be on town property. Yeah. On town property. So yeah. is there anything in Southern Woodbridge where that... Do we have any town falls? Is there such a... Well, obviously there's any big... Where we have an electric... We don't own any of it. Yeah. No, no, I, no, I didn't say. I mean, down, there's New Haven also. Down in that area, well, is oh. there uh, even? That's kind of I'm trying to think of that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. thinking if there's but any place. The thing about the library is we, you could cause traffic there. I mean, you know. Well, it would go in the, um, the um, I believe where they decided was, were you at the commission? Small park, I was. Small, you were there, okay. So it would no, be the I small parking lot, right? Yeah, the small parking lot on Newton. To the left. 
right. They're not near right. the, the old where the right. less traffic is anyways. But it would have to be in the front corner mm -hmm. kind of because it has to be within so many feet of where the electrical is. They run a copper so, line. You know, Make so a long story short, it would be on the side where, let's say, the, the old firehouse side mm -hmm. rather than the northern side. And it would take up a, a space. Terry made a presentation saying it would probably be posed basically between two spots. It's more of a post. It's actually a little different than this one, I believe. Um, so that two cars can charge. So that possibly that? two two spaces could be used. Not that two, two spaces cars can be used at one time. Right, right. But in other words, if somebody happened to be parking in this space, there is also, um, and I could pass this around, that he gave at the library. I guess you're, there's an option of three choices of what your sign says, and there was some concern at the library because one of the options that you may see at some of these stations is no parking at any time other than for this vehicle, and they didn't want to lose the space. But there are options, and Terry said he would probably propose, I think it was number two, which is you can park here even if you're not charging. So and that would... As I understand it, also the, uh, the Library Commission did consider this and approved it. Mm -hmm. Their concern was that they not be penalized in any way if their electric Watch. bill goes up. Right. As Tony has said, there's not too much risk of that, right. and, right. Um, and right. we would be aware of it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's, it's a grant. We don't have to accept it, but it's available to us. I think it, it's a good I, I, point. I kind of like when people give us money. You know, well, but I mean, it's that, not giving. But, but, but it's giving it's someone's money. It's, someone's money. Like, yeah, it's coming in my right pocket. The bit. point is, do we need two of these for twenty-six cars right here? I, 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 I think it may know. encourage residents, right. more residents. I, I'm thinking about doing it at some point when the Tesla won't even buy. No. <laughs> <laughs> Expensive car, but I think it would encourage, and it shows us I like the idea of promoting green energy. I think it's a great idea. But we do I have one. Can I just ask that we look to see if there's any property in Southern Woodbridge uh, nearer the parkway, nearer where more, there's more of a dense population, and it, we still would have this one. We're not removing one, which I understand this one isn't used all the time. But if we could separate them a little further and get more usage out of them or maybe bring more people to them. Or does the town feel we don't want to do that because we don't want to give them the free energy for at least, what is it, the first two years? I think, no, I think, I think Terry I said think two years. years. I think you said yeah. three, but mm -hmm. let me off the board right now. It, well, we certainly can. Uh, no property comes to mind. That doesn't mean there right, is right. nothing. I can't think but of it that. has to be a place where Within, you can park. And, 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 right. and there's some requirements. There has to, and be, has to be town. Yeah. And you have yeah. to bring electric to it. I'm just wondering right. if it is possible. Maybe right. there's a spot that I don't know over. Well, well, does the grant require us that we determine a spot now, or are we yes. just applying for the general? Okay. The grant, the the specific one, um, was for the library. Whether there's a process to change to change that, I mean, they, they sort of want to encourage a spot where people visit, where it can get used, you know. Well, you can do something else do while so your car you, is right, charging. Perhaps. Well, right. it does occur to me that, I mean, I don't know how many people actually know about this one. And if you put it at the library, even the bigger parking, I mean, the that's true. center lot, it becomes much more visible mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. I mean, I think that the, the idea that you're promoting this kind of energy, actually, there may be more bang for the buck with that second charging station than there is. That's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. No, no, I understand. Here, I understand what you're saying. That we're already saying, please uh, grant the nobody movie. ever uses it. Well, but you could put a little sign in there that says a second <laughs> charging station. Yeah, it's 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 there. There. Because it takes a long time. If somebody charges, it yeah. takes a while. Up to four hours. Yeah. It may yeah. somebody Two or three, three hours and then get shot. I was kind of kidding, but could the grant be used to move the one we have to a better center, more location? Not this one. No, I don't I think not this particular one. Right. Because it was next to public works. Right. Correct. Was, yeah. It was part of that project, yeah. as I recall. Well, let's just look in to see if there's another property in the meantime. But we, you said there's a deadline for accepting this. We have to accept it now? No, um, it has to be um, operational by May 1st. Ooh, of, of six of this year. Operational. So, how long does it so take? It to, to, uh, you know, it takes. Um, that one took. Depends where you have it and what you have to do to connect it, but um, as, I think as, lo as long as it's within the next month or two, we should be fine. Well, I, I would suggest that we vote on it now at the library with the understanding that we will check this week to yep. see if there's any other property we and we'll revisit it. If there's an opportunity to place it somewhere else, we can vote it up or down <coughs> at the side. So I'll make the motion that we. Um, that we accept the grant for the electric vehicle charging station at the library. Is there a second? I'll second it. Um, well, let, let me change. That. I'm sorry. Right. Let me change it. That I'll we accept we accept the grant um, with the proviso that if we find suitable 
town land uh, in a different location that we will revisit this grant and see about changing the location. I'll second that. Okay. Any other questions or discussion? Yeah, I have one more question. Yes. Do we know if there's any ongoing maintenance costs or anything we have to supply after a certain period of time? In other words, I realize for two years we have to provide free electricity. Right. We can't electronically monitor who's using our home budget. Right, right. After that time, if we want to charge for it, we can. Correct. But also, is there a maintenance at one point, and who is responsible for whatever that upkeep is of the, so do we know that? Um, uh, there's been no significant maintenance responsibilities identified in this process. I've talked about this at length with Terry, who's um, a lot more knowledgeable than, about this than I am. And obviously, if something breaks, it would have to be fixed. But um, um, I'm not aware of any other regular maintenance other than. Do, do we know what the technology span is here or the life? In other words, we can't make any money for two or three years. I'm not even clear on that. But it says three. It's a, yeah, it says it's three. It says okay. the certification is fully operational and the awardee has committed to maintain and operate the unit for three years. So in three years, we, we don't make any money. It costs us money, not, not a whole lot, but it costs us money. In three years, are these going to be obsolete stations? Does anybody have If we knew that. On? That's a good question. <laughs> well, I think it's a good question. <laughs> Before we put two within 100 yards of each other and, and it costs us money, I think it's something we should look into to see if what happens then if, if they're somewhat obsolete. Do, do we, does the grant provide continuing upgrade of, of, these, of this technology or are green energy yeah. but <laughs> uh, as I understand it we have no obligation to continue after the three years we're making Correct. a three-year commitment right. if we find at the end of three years it's not worthwhile we don't no, want to do it three years we don't have, have to do it that's correct we can make it a hitching post are these right. solar powered right but no that's no, when that's we can make that's when we can bring copper that can right that's when we can actually earn on it. After That's when we can earn on it. So then but we make it a hitching post? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm no, saying, but, but, that, but that's when you do a different cost-benefit analysis. Well, right. okay. that, yeah. You know, so is the technology or the maintenance or the insulation or the cost of supplying electricity, right. does that have value as against the So income? in the meantime, right. we put the meantime, two right next to each other. It costs us money.